During this time, there was produced in the Mesian Olympos, a boar of monstrous size. This coming down from the mountain aforesaid ravaged the fields of the Mesians, and although the Mesians went out against it often, yet they could do it no hurt, but rather received hurt themselves from it. So at length messengers came from the Mesians to Croesus and said, O king, there has appeared in our land a boar of monstrous size, which lays waste our fields, and we, desiring eagerly to take it, are not able. Now therefore we ask of thee to send with us thy son and also a chosen band of young men with dogs, that we may destroy it out of our land. Thus they made request, and Croesus, calling to mind the words of the dream, spoke to them as follows. As touching my son, make no further mention of him in this matter, for I will not send him with you, seeing that he is newly married and is concerned now with the affairs of his marriage. But I will send with you chosen men of the Lydians and the whole number of my hunting dogs, and I will give command to those who go to be as zealous as may be in helping you to destroy the wild beast out of your land." Thus he made reply, and while the Mesians were being contented with this answer, there came in also the son of Croesus, having heard of the request made by the Mesians, and when Croesus said that he would not send his son with them, the young man spoke as follows, My father, in, past, in times past, the fairest and most noble part was allotted to us, to go out continually to wars and to chase, and so have good repute. But now thou hast debarred me from both of these. Although thou hast not observed in me any cowardly or faint-hearted spirit, and now with that, and now with what face must I appear when I go to and from the marketplace of the city? What kind of man shall I be esteemed by the citizens? And what kind of man shall I be esteemed by my newly married wife? With what kind of husband will she think that she is mated? Therefore, either let me go to the hunt or persuade me by reason that these things are better for me done as now they are. And Croesus made, this, made answer thus, My son, not because I have observed in thee any spirit of cowardice or any other ungracious thing do I act thus, but a vision of a dream came and stood by me in my sleep and told me that thou shouldest be short-lived and that thou shouldest perish by, the, by a spear point of iron. With thought of this vision, therefore, I both urged on this marriage for thee, and I refused now to send thee upon the matter which is being taken in hand, having a care of thee. that I may steal thee from thy fate, at least for the period of my own life, if by any means possible for me to do so. For thou art, as it chances, my only son. The other I do not reckon as one, seeing that he is deficient in hearing. The young man made answer thus, It may, be, it may well be forgiven in thee, O my father, that thou shouldest have a care of me after having seen such a vision. But that which thou dost not understand, and in which the meaning of the dream has escaped thee, it is right that I should expound to thee. Thou sayest the dream declare that I should end my life by means of a spear point of iron. But what hands has a boar, or what spear point of iron, of which thou art afraid, if the dream had told thee that I should end my life by a tusk, or any other thing which resembles that? It would be right for thee doubtless to do as thou art doing, but it's said by a spear point, since therefore our fight will not be with men. Let me now go." Croesus made answer, My son, thou dost partly prevail with me by declaring thy judgment about the dream. Therefore, having been prevailed upon by thee, I chance my resolution and allow thee to go to the chase. Having thus said, Croesus went to, the, went to summon Adrastos the Phrygian, and when he came, he addressed him thus, Adrastos, when thou wast struck with a grievous misfortune, with which I reproach thee not, I cleansed thee, and I have received thee into my house, supplying all thy costs. Now, therefore, since having first received kindness from me, thou art bound to requit me with kindness. I ask of thee to be the protector of my son who goes forth to the chase, lest any evil robbers come upon you by the way to do you harm. And besides this, thou too oughtest to go where thou mayest become famous by, the, by thy deeds, for it belongs to thee as an inheritance from thy father so to do. 
and moreover thou hast strength for it. Adrastos made answer, O king, but for this I should not have been going to any such contest of valor, for first it is not fitting that one who is suffering such a great misfortune as mine should seek the company of his fellows who are in prosperity, and secondly I have no desire for it, and for many reasons I should have kept myself away. But now, since thou art urgent with me, and I ought to gratify thee, for I am bound to requite thee with kindness, I am ready to do this, except therefore that thy son, whom thou commandest me to protect, will return home to thee unhurt, so far as his protector may avail to keep him safe. When he had made answer to Croesus in words like these, they afterwards set forth provided with chosen young men and with dogs, and when they were come to Mount Olympos, they tracked the animal, and having found it and taken their stand round in a circle, they were hurling against it their spears. Then the guest he who had been cleansed of manslaughter, whose name was Adrastos, hurling a spear at it, missed the boar and struck the son of Croesus. So he being struck by the spear point fulfilled the saying of the dream, and one ran to report to Croesus that which had come to pass, and having come to Sardis, he signified to him of the combat and of the fate of his son, and Croesus was very greatly disturbed by the death of his son, and was much the more moved to complaining by this, namely that his son was slain by the man whom he had himself cleansed of manslaughter. And being grievously troubled by the misfortune, he called upon Zeus the cleanser, protesting to him that which he had suffered from his guest, and he called moreover upon the protector of suppliance and the guardian of friendship, naming still the same God and calling upon him as the protector of suppliance, because when he received the guest into his house, he had been fostering ignorantly the slayer of his son, and as the guardian of friendship, because having sent him as a protector, he had found him the worst of foes. After this, the Lydians came bearing the corpse, and behind it followed the slayer, and he, taking his stand before the corpse, delivered himself up to Croesus, holding forth his hands and bidding the king slay him over the corpse, speaking of his former misfortune, and saying that in addition to this he had now been the destroyer of the man who had cleansed him of it, and that life for him was no more worth living. But Croesus, hearing this, pitied Adrastos, although he was himself suffering so great an evil of his own and said to him, Guest, I have already received from thee all the satisfaction that is due, seeing that thou dost condemn thyself to suffer death, and not thou alone art the cause of this evil, except in so far as thou wert the instrument of it against thine own will, but someone, as I suppose, of the gods, who also long ago signified to me that which was about to be. So Croesus buried his son, as was fitting, but Adrastos, the son of Gordius, the son of Midas, he who had been the slayer of his own brother, and the slayer also of the man who had cleansed him, when silence came of all men round about the tomb, recognizing that he was more grievously burdened by misfortune than all men of whom he knew, slew himself upon the grave. For two years then Croesus remained quiet in his mourning, because he was deprived of his son. But after this period of, of time, the overthrowing of the rule of Astyages... Astyages, the son of Caiaxeres by Cyrus, the son of Cambyses, Cambyses, and the growing greatness of the Persians caused Croesus to cease from his mourning and led him to a care of cutting short the power of Persians, if by any means he might, while yet it was in growth and before they should have become great. So having formed this design, he began forthwith to make trial of the oracles, both those of the Hellenes and that in Libya, sending messengers, some to one place and some to another, some to go to Delphi, others to Abai of the Phocians, and others to Dodon. Dodana, and some were sent to the shrine of Amphiarios and to that of Trophonios, others to Brancidae and the land of Miletos. These are the oracles of the Hellenes to which Croesus sent messengers to seek divination, and others he sent to the shrine of Ammon in Libya to inquire there. Now he was sending the messengers abroad to the end that he might try the oracles and find out what knowledge they had so that if they should be found to have knowledge of the truth, he might send and ask them, secondly, whether he should attempt to march against the Persians. And to the Lydians, whom he sent to make trial of the oracles, he gave charge as follows, that from the day on which they set out from Sardis, they should reckon upon the number of the days following and on the hundredth day they should consult the oracles, ask Asking what Croesus, the son of Elidus, 
king of the Lydians, chance then to be doing, and whatever the oracles severally should prophesy, this they should cause to be written down and bear it back to him. Now what the other oracles prophesied is not by any reported, but at Delphi, so soon as the Lydians entered the sanctuary of the temple, to consult the god and asked that which they were commanded to ask, the Pythian prophetess spoke thus in hexameter measure. But the number of sand I know, and the measure of drops in the ocean, the dumb man I understand, and I hear the speech of the speechless, and there hath come to my soul the smell of a strong-shelled tortoise, boiling in cauldron of bronze, and the flesh of a lamb mingled with it. Under it bronze is laid, it hath bronze as a clothing upon it. When the Pythian prophetess had uttered this oracle, the Lydians caused the prophecy to be written down and went away at once to Sardis. And when the rest also who had been sent round were there arrived with the answers of the oracles, then Croesus unfolded the writings one by one and looked upon them. And at first none of them pleased him, but when he heard that from Delphi forthwith he did worship the god and accepted the answer, judging that the oracle at Delphi was the only true one, because it had found out what he himself had done. For when he had sent to the several oracles his messengers to consult the gods, keeping well in mind the appointed day he contrived the following device, he thought of something which it would be impossible to discover or to conceive of, and cutting up a tortoise and a lamb, he boiled them together himself in a cauldron of bronze, laying a cover of bronze over them. This then was the answer given to Croesus from Delphi, and as regards the answers of Amphiarios, I cannot tell what he replied to the Lydians, after they had done things customary in his temple. For there is no record of this any more than of the others, except only that Croesus thought that he also possessed a true oracle. After this, with great sacrifices, he endeavored to win the favor of the god at Delphi. For of all the animals that are fit for sacrifice, he offered three thousand of each kind, and he heaped up couches overlaid with gold and overlaid with silver and cups of gold and robes of purple and tunics, making of them a great pyre. And this he burnt up, hoping by these means the more to win over the god to the side of the Lydians. And he proclaimed to all the Lydians that every one of them should make sacrifice with that which each man had. And when he had had finished the sacrifice, he melted down a vast quantity of gold, and of it he wrought half plinths, making them six palms in length, and three in breadth, and in height one palm, and their number was one hundred and seventeen. Of these four were of pure gold, weighing two talents, and a half each, and others of gold alloyed with silver, weighing two talents, and he caused to be made also an image of a lion of pure gold, weighing ten talents, which lion, when the temple of Delphi was being burnt down, fell from off the half plinths, for upon these it was set, and it, it and is placed now in the treasury of the Corinthians, weighing six talents and a half, for three talents and a half were melted away from it. So Croesus, having finished all these things, sent them to Delphi, and with them these besides two mixing bowls of great size, one of gold and the other of silver, of which the gold bowl was placed on the right hand as one enters the temple, and the silver on the left, but the places of these also were changed after the temple was burnt down, and the golden bowl is now placed in the treasury of the people of Clazomenai, weighing eight and a half talents and twelve pounds over, while the silver one is placed in the corner of the vestibule and holds six hundred amphores, being filled with wine by the Delphians on the feast of the Theophania. This the people of Delphi say is the work of Theodorus the Samian, and as I think rightly, for it is evident to me that the workmanship is of no common kind. Moreover, Croesus sent four silver wine jars, which stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, and two vessels for lustral water, one of gold and the other of silver, of which the gold one is inscribed from the Lacedaemonians, who say that it is their offering. Therein, however, they do not speak rightly, for this also is from Croesus. But one of the Delphians wrote, in, wrote the inscription upon it, desiring to gratify the Lacedaemonians, and his name I know but will not make mention of it. The boy through whose hand the water flows is from the Lacedaemonians, but neither of the vessel for lustral water. And many over votive offerings Croesus sent with these, not specially distinguished among which are certain castings of silver of a round shape, and also a gold figure of a woman three cubits high, which the Delphians say is a statue of the baker of Croesus. Moreover, Croesus dedicated the ornaments from his wife's neck and her girdles. 
These are the things which he sent to Delphi and to Amphiaros. Having heard of his valor and of his evil fate, he dedicated a shield made altogether of gold throughout, and a spear all of solid gold, the shaft being of gold also as well as the two points, which offerings were both remaining even to my time at Thebes in the temple of Ismenian Apollo. To the Lydians who were to carry these gifts to the temples, Croesus gave charge that they should ask the oracles this question also, whether Croesus should march against the Persians, and if so, whether he should join with himself any army of men as his, as his friends. And when the Lydians had arrived at the places to which they had been sent and had dedicated the votive offerings, they inquired of the oracles and said, Croesus, king of the Lydians and of other nations, considering that these are the only true oracles among men, presents presents to you gifts such as your revelations deserve, and ask you again now whether he shall march against the Persians, and if so, whether he shall join with himself any army of men as allies. They inquired thus, and the answers of both the oracles agreed in one, declaring to Croesus that if he should march against the Persians, he should destroy a great empire, and they counseled him to find out the most powerful of the Hellenes, and join these with himself as friends. So when the answers were brought back in Croesus heard them. He was delighted with the oracles and expecting that he would certainly destroy the kingdom of Cyrus. He sent again to Pytho and presenting to the men of Delphi, having ascertained the number of them, two staters of gold for each man. And in return for this, the Delphians gave to Croesus and to the Lydians precedence in consulting the oracle and freedom from all payments and the right to front seats of the games with this privilege also for all time that any of them who wished should be allowed to become a citizen of Delphi. And having made presents to the men of Delphi, Croesus consulted the oracle the third time, for from the time when he learned the truth of the oracle, he made abundant use of it. And consulting the oracle, he inquired whether his monarchy would endure for a long time. And the Pythian prophetess answered him thus, But when it cometh to pass that a mule of the Medes shall be monarch, then by the pebbly Hermos, O Lydian, delicate-footed, flee and stay not, and be not ashamed to be called a coward." By these lines, when they came to him, Croesus was pleased more than by all the rest, for he supposed that a mule would never be a ruler of the Medes instead of a man, and according that he himself and his heirs would never cease from their rule. Then after this, he gave thought to inquire which people of the Hellenes he should esteem the most powerful and gain over to himself as friends. And inquiring, he found that the Lacedaemonians and the Athenians had the preeminence, the first of the Dorian and the others of the Ionian race, for these were the most eminent races in ancient time, the second being a Pelasgian and the first a Hellenic race, and the one never migrated from its place in any direction, while the other was very exceedingly given to wanderings. For in the reign of Deucalion, this race dwelt in Theotis, and in the time of Doros, the son of Helen, in the land lying below Ossa and Olympus, which is called Histiates. Histia Iotis, and when it was driven from Histia Iotis by the sons of Cadmos, it dwelt in Pindos and was called Machidnia, Machidnian, and thence it moved afterwards to Dryopis, and from Dryopis it came finally to Pella. Panesis, and began to be called Dorian. What language, what language, however, the Pelasgians used to speak, I am not able with certainty to say. But if one must pronounce judging by those that still remain of the Pelasgians who dwelt in the city of Creston above the Tyrsenians, and who were once neighbors of the race now called Dorian, dwelling then in the land which is now called Thesa Leotis, and also by those that remain of the Pelasgians who settled at Plakia and Skylak in the region of the Hellespont, who before that had been settlers with the Athenians, and of the natives of the various other towns which are really Pelasgian, though they have lost the name. If one must pronounce judging by these, the Pelasgians used to speak a barbarian language. If therefore all the Pelasgian race was such as these, then the Attic race being Pelasgian at the same time, when it changed and became Hellenic, unlearnt also its language.
For the people of Creston do not speak the same language with any of those who dwell about them, nor yet do the people of Phakia, but they speak the same language one as the other. And by this it is proved that they still keep unchanged the form of language which they brought with them when they migrated to these places. As for the Hellenic race, it has used ever the same language, as I clearly perceive, since it first took its rise. But since the time when it parted off feeble at first from the Pelasgian race, setting forth from a small beginning, it has increased to that great number of races which we see, and chiefly because many barbarian races have been added to it besides. Moreover, it is true, as I think of the Pelasgian race also, that so far as it remained barbarian, it never made any great increase. Of these races, then, Croesus was informed that the Athenian was held subject and torn with faction by Piestistratos, the son of Hippocrates, who then was despot of the Athenians. For Hippocrates, when as a private citizen, he went to view the Olympic Games. A great marvel had occurred after he had offered the sacrifice. The cauldrons which were standing upon the hearth, full of pieces of flesh and of water, boiled without fire under them and ran over. And Chilon, the Lacedaemonian, who chanced to have been present and to have seen the marvel, advised Hippocrates first not to bring into his house a wife to bear him children, and secondly, if he happened to have one already, to dismiss her, and he chanced to have a son, and if he chanced to have a son, to disown him. When Chilon had thus recommended Hippocrates, they say, was not willing to be persuaded. And so there was born to him afterwards this Piesistratos, who then, who when the Athenians of the shore were at feud with those of the plain Megacles, the son of Alcmaeon, Alcmaeon, being leader of the first faction, the Lycurgos, the son of Aristolides, of that of the plain, aimed at the despotism for himself and gathered a third party. So then, after having collected supporters and called him the, and called himself leader of the men of the mountain lands, he contrived a device as he contrived a device as follows: He inflicted wounds upon himself and upon his mules, and then drove his car into the marketplace as if he had just escaped from his opponents, who as he alleged, had desired to kill him when he was driving into the country, and he asked the commons that he might obtain some protection from them. For before this, he had gained reputation in his command against the Megarians, during which he took Nisai and performed other signal service. And the commons of the Athenians being deceived gave him those men chosen from the dwellers in the city, who became not indeed the spearmen of Piesistratos, but this club men, for they followed behind him bearing wooden clubs, and these made insurrection with Piesistratos and obtained possession of the Acropolis. Then Piesistratos was ruler of the Athenians, not having disturbed the existing magistrates, nor changed the ancient laws, but he administered the state under that constitution of things which was already established, ordering it fairly and well.